Hi, I'm Louis Rudd and I'm the first person in history to have traversed the Antarctic landmass twice. When I was around uh, 12 years old and I just started uh, secondary school and I probably wasn't the best behaved of uh, school children and I got myself into a spot of bother and I got sent to see the headmaster. And I remember sitting in this small reception room outside the headmaster's office, pretty, uh, pretty terrified uh, about what was you know, about to happen and there was a small bookshelf off to one side and I just remember randomly grabbing a book off the shelf you know without paying any particular attention and it happened to be this small ladybird book uh, titled Captain Scott and it was the first time I'd become a you know heard about Antarctica and polar explorers and I just remember flicking through this small book and you look at these images and, and reading this epic story of Captain Scott and his men and their desperate struggle to be the first guys to, to reach the South Pole. And I was reading this you know, amazing life and death story and suddenly my own situation of mild peril about to go in and, and get caned by the, the headmaster, it suddenly seemed you know, not so terrifying at all uh, and completely kind of changed my perspective. And I, I guess at that point I decided you know, I wanted to you know, go down to Antarctica and see this place myself and, and be a polar explorer. So uh, having completed the, the Spear expedition, which was a, a crossing of the uh, Antarctic landmass, it had always been in the back of my mind, I guess, you know, to, to go back down to Antarctica and attempt to, to go across the, the landmass solo. And the plan was, yeah, to get uh, dropped on the Ron Ice Shelf at the edge of the Antarctic landmass and ski solo and without any form of resupply. Uh, right away across the continent and step onto the Ross Ice Shelf on the far side. And it was an expedition that, uh, that no one had uh, done before. There was a lot of difficult times uh, on that expedition. It was about halfway through the day. I'd been going for about six or seven hours. I was pretty exhausted. And I'd obviously skied up onto quite a large block of this Sastrugi. And I was you know, probably a few feet up in the air, traveling across the top of this block and at the end of it was a wind scoop where the wind had carved out a bit of a trench and so it ended up with about an, an eight foot sort of drop sort of eight foot cliff face off the end of this block of ice that i was on and i just couldn't see it and suddenly i just, I just fell straight off the end of it absolutely terrified and but then face planted into the rock hard ice below uh, the impact uh, split the tip of my ski open bruised my uh, my chest and uh, popped my lip i think a second later the uh, the pulk which obviously tethered behind me on a piece of rope came over probably still weighing about 100 kilograms at this point and landed flat across my back it took me a couple of minutes to struggle out from underneath and luckily you know i didn't have any any major injuries i was kind of a bit a bit bust up and, and a bit shook up as well and I just remember sitting there for about sort of 10 or 15 minutes and just thinking, you know, what on earth am I doing here? You know, this, this is getting so dangerous now and, and is this even possible? But again, it was just going back to those reasons why, you know, why I'd chosen to be there, why I was doing this expedition and reminding myself of that, you know, eventually I was able to, you know, get myself up and, and dust myself off and think, right, you know, kind of carry on. And eventually, later that day, you know, this astrugi started to ease and, and the following day, the whiteout lifted and, you know, and things became kind of, you know, a little bit easier again. And there's a saying, there's no such thing uh, as an easy day in Antarctica, just, you know, just different levels, uh, different degrees of hardness. That was well, definitely one point in the expedition where I really started to question why I was there. There was another um, situation. I was in a, an area of really deep, soft snow. I'd heard it snowing all through the night while I was in the tent, and I knew I was gonna be in for a battle the next day. And so I got out of the tent, packed all the, all the gear as usual, and I went to set off, and I could barely move uh, the polk. My skis were sinking, the polk was sinking in this sort of soft snow. Uh, and normally, you know, if you have the luxury of time, and you know, if it was with the team, I'd probably, stop for the day, um, let the wind compact the surface, you know, temperatures come down and hopefully harden things up and, and make better progress. But I was really up against it in terms of time and how much food and fuel I had left to complete the crossing. So what I decided to do was, was remove half of the equipment from my sledge and pile it up in the snow, uh, ski forward a couple of miles so with the other half of the gear, drop that off and then turn around, follow my ski tracks back uh, and pick up the rest of the gear. So to go forward one mile, I was doing three miles, which is, again, mentally quite, quite exhausting and challenging, but at least I was making some progress. 
So later on in the day, I basically I stopped GPS marking where I'd left the gear uh, behind because all I was doing was turning around and just following this motorway of ski tracks um, back to it. Uh, and it was right towards the end of the day, I dropped off. And again, another schoolboy era, it was, it was the tent and the sleeping bag, uh, some of the food sacks and some of the gear I'd left um, in a pile. I was about two miles further south towards the pole and I kind of noticed the wind picking up and the weather starting to deteriorate. And I turned around and as I was skiing back about a mile in, the wind had started to fill in my ski tracks. And after about a mile and a half, I just completely lost my ski tracks. So at that point, I was purely on the compass, on a back bearing and kind of estimating the distance, how far I had to go to get to this pile of gear. Uh, and after about half an hour, I hadn't come across it. I was pretty concerned because it was the tent and the sleeping bag. And if I didn't recover that kit, I was potentially in a, in a life-threatening situation. I decided to deploy um, a thing called a box search method, which is something I'd done in the military. And it took me nearly just under two hours. Uh, so eventually I stumbled across uh, the gear, which by this point was half buried. Uh, when, I, when I found it, I literally sank to my knees and sobbed uh, and certainly offered up a few prayers because that really could have been uh, the end of the expedition at that point. It was a huge sense of relief uh, to be able to finish the, the expedition. And when you are successful, you know, on a major expedition like this, the kind of self-belief that it, that it gives you about, you know, what you are truly capable of is just expanded. For me, the most important thing is, is understanding the why, uh, why you're doing it. I think you've, if you've got that, clear in your mind as to why you're there uh, and why you're taking this on and if that belief is strong enough you know that that's what's going to carry you through the the difficult days you know during an expedition if you really believe in in what you're doing if you've got that nailed from the beginning then absolutely that is going to is going to carry you through to uh, expedition success you know i think it's sensible not to take on something too ambitious straight away it's it's really all about kind of slowly broadening your experience uh, and skills and kind of pushing yourself just, you know, outside that comfort zone a little bit and realizing, okay, I can kind of cope with that. You know, what's the next step? You know, what do I take on next? It definitely leads to, you know, that element of self-belief, you know, which I think, you know, is, is beneficial through all parts of your, your life.